Wow, it's a big room. Um, thanks uh, for being here and doing what you're doing for the field. So I'm going to tell you about some of the challenges that my team is working on in AI and uh, deep learning. And um, I think uh, it's interesting to see a convergence here of um, questions being asked on the side of machine learning researchers like myself and um, people doing robotics and automation. Um, more and more, the perspective that uh, is, is becoming important in our research is the perspective of an agent which acts in the world. And this really changes the perspective of uh, the traditional view of machine learning. So what I'll tell you about here, I think, is very much inspired by these questions that come up. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, what I'm talking about is, uh, has nothing to do with my private interest. It's very theoretical. Um, I've embarked in deep learning because I thought that one of the biggest questions for AI was, um, what are good representations? What are the right representations for doing tasks like um, the decisions that a robot has to take? And from the beginning, one of the answers that we could formulate but we couldn't articulate very well was that the right representations would capture the sort of high-level variables that we use in language um, that I like to call causal variables because they tend to be cause, effect, or how cause and effect are related to each other. And so one of the things that I'll tell you about is uh, today is we're trying to use um, observations and interventions and changes in distribution in order to have a learner be able to discover those causal variables and how they're related to each other. So um, this is uh, related to the question of how we can transform the data into a new space such that these causal variables or these explanatory variables um, are separated from each other. So I introduced the term disentangling a few years ago to talk about that. And it remains a very important open subject in machine learning. How do we transform raw data like images and sensor data into a space where the, these variables um, are uh, identified, even though we don't know ahead of time what they should be? Um, that's also connected to uh, the question, very deep question in AI, which is, uh, how does a learner, which builds a model of the world, decompose its knowledge into the right pieces so that those pieces are going to be easy to reuse in different contexts? So this is a question of modularization. Uh, whether it's uh, decomposing procedures and, and, and um, policies or um, decomposing um, relationships between random variables. So um, today I'm going to tell you about a piece of work where we try to um, introduce new assumptions in order to deal with uh, these questions of uh, transfer to new distributions, modularization, and, and discovering new variables. Um, so uh, whereas classical machine learning is really about observing static data, uh, when you have agents that intervene in the world, um, when you have uh, not just the learner itself intervening in the world, but other agents doing things, the distribution that the learner is observing is going to change. And those changes in distribution traditionally have been a big hurdle for machine learning because uh, we, we've had this uh, idea that you know, we have one distribution and we observe data from that distribution and then we can test or apply the, the, the learner on uh, samples from the same distribution. But in the real world, when you have a robot that changes its environment, so when you have other agents that change the environment, the distribution is, it, that keeps changing. So it's a non-stationary uh, process that, that guides the data. And so, um, if we don't assume anything about how the world changes, then we can't really uh, have any uh, handle on, on those changes. But, but if we think about how the world changes due to agency, then there is a natural assumption that we are trying to exploit here. And um, the assumption is that the change in distribution is going to be localized in the right space of representation. So um, I'm going to come back to that. Um, and if we decompose our knowledge and, and the right variables, uh, into the right variables and the right uh, sets of relationships between them, then the change in distribution will involve only um, a few parts of that. So very few parameters will need to be adapted to deal with those changes. This is, what the, this is the heart of uh, the, the topic of my presentation today. Um, right. So this question of being able to deal with changes in distribution is actually at the heart of the current limitations of machine learning. Right? So we've made a, a amazing progress in machine learning in the last um, 20 years, and in great part thanks to deep learning. But um, when you look at um, real-world applications, what often happens is that the, um, 
cases where we want to use the system um, don't obey the same distribution as the cases on which they were trained. And so you, you have um, a sort of generalization problem which isn't what we're usually thinking of. When we think about generalization traditionally in machine learning, we think of um, generalizing to samples from the same distribution. But when you have these changes in distribution, uh, what do you do? Well, you have to adapt to those changes or you have to be able to, to, to infer what the changes were. And, and being able to separate the knowledge about the world in the right pieces is a crucial ingredient in doing that, I believe. So towards this, um, in our work, we took inspiration from um, many years of research uh, in the intersection of causality and machine learning, in particular by the group of Bernard Schalpkopf in, uh, in Germany. Um, and they introduced this idea of independent mechanisms, which is uh, motivated by considerations from physics. So if you think about how the world is organized from the physics point of view, you can think of it like it's the combination of um, many mechanisms, like physical mechanisms, um, which are independent of each other in an information theoretical sense, meaning that um, what I know about one mechanism does not inform me about another mechanism. And so if one of those mechanisms changes, then I don't need to relearn everything. I only need to learn about that particular mechanism. But, but that works only if I have identified those mechanisms, if I have separated, disentangled them. Okay, so, so we're gonna make that assumption and we're gonna try to exploit it in order to have um, robust machine learning systems that can deal with those changes in distribution and actually discover causal relationships between the variables that they observe. Um, yeah, um, one reason why this hypothesis uh, makes sense is that when an agent intervenes in the world, typically uh, because of, of the constraints from physics, uh, very few things will actually change, right? So um, um, we have uh, you know, a spatial and a temporal location and we act at a particular time and space. And so just uh, at a high level, just uh, uh, one or a few things are changed due to the result of a, an intervention. And that's why you know, this uh, idea that only one or a few mechanisms are changing is, is an interesting hypothesis. So, so now we're gonna make a claim that if we had the right decomposition of knowledge into the, those pieces, um, that we have found the right uh, set of independent mechanisms, and that we get those sort of uh, local changes where only one or a few mechanisms change when we go from one distribution to another one, then we get an advantage in terms of how fast we can recover from a change in distribution. And so in, in machine learning, we call that sample complexity, like how many examples do I need of the new data in order to do a good job on it? And, and that's something that comes up in, in many situations in domain adaptation, transfer learning, agent learning, anytime you have a change in distribution. We would like our learning systems to be robust to changes in the world. We would like our learning systems to adapt quickly to those changes. So, so again, I'm showing the same picture. I'm gonna give you an example. Let's say that uh, you know, each of those nodes represent a piece of knowledge. Maybe uh, in, in the work that I'm talking about, it's, it's, a, it's a random variable and it's conditional distribution given other variables. So this is a directed graphical model. Um, and then there is something that changes in the world. Like, let's say I close my eyes right now and everything seems to have changed. Like all the pixels have changed. But that's because I'm looking at things in, in the wrong perspective. If I'm looking at it at, at the, the pixel level, it looks like a lot of things have changed when I close my eyes. But I, if I look at things in the right space where there's only one bit that says my eyes are closed or open, then it's a very small change, right? So, so uh, being able to exploit this locality and changes uh, also requires learning the correct representations where those high-level variables which change only sparsely um, are gonna be represented explicitly. Um, and the reason we can get um, a, a fast adaptation or a smaller um, sample complexity if we do this is because when the change is localized, it means that very few parameters need to be adapted. And so the number of examples needed to move those parameters to the right space is gonna be smaller. This is just uh, a, a, a result from standard learning theory. Okay, that's what I just said. Um, so let me give you an example of this, which I'm gonna use for the, the rest of my presentation. Um, we're gonna consider a very simple learning problem. Maybe there's very few uh, simpler ones, but, but that involve causality. So 
we observe two random variables A and B, let's say two scalars. And uh, it doesn't have to be, but um, in the underlying ground truth that relates those variables, one is a cause, say A, without loss of generality, and the other is the effect, say B. And we can represent their joint distribution in various ways, but uh, in terms of conditional distributions, you can either say the joint is uh, uh, P of A times P of B given A, or P of B times P of A given B. And, and one of these is, is aligned with uh, the causal direction. Um, so let's see what happens if we had the, the right choice of model where we, we say it's P of A times P of B given A, which is aligned with causality. Um, now let's consider a change in distribution. So we start with data from the first distribution, P1. And, uh, and then we're gonna have, uh, uh, we're gonna be able to train on that, but then the distribution is gonna change to P2. And let's say that um, the change involves a change in the cause, which is the most useful kind of change. Because when you change the cause, it's gonna have an effect on, on the effect variables. So if the cause is A, then P of A changes. And now the learner, of course, the learner doesn't know which is cause and which is effect. What, that's what it's trying to figure out. The learner is gonna try to adapt all of its parameters. So P of A is gonna have to adapt. Um, but P of B given A already has the right answer because that didn't change, right? We only changed the marginal distribution of A. When we changed, we set the value of A to something or we modify the way that A is computed, um, uh, the relationship between B and A in terms of P of B given A didn't change. And so the gradient on P of B given A, the parameters of P of B given A, is gonna be zero under the new distribution. So that's interesting, right? That's what I was talking about before, that when the change is localized, say here it's in P of A, uh, we need to adapt P of A, of course, but the other parts of the model, uh, which didn't change, uh, don't need to change. The gradient, the average gradient on them will be zero. And if we had the wrong way of factorizing knowledge, the wrong way of factorizing the joint, so here P of B times P of A given B would, would, would be the wrong answer, then it, you wouldn't have this advantage. Uh, in other words, uh, when I change P of A, both P of B and P of A given B need to change in order to reflect the change in P of A. Right? This is just a, a consequence, a trivial consequence of the theorem of Bayes' theorem. And so what this is saying is that if I have the wrong way of representing the relationship between A and B, then all of my parameters are gonna need to adapt to the change in distribution, maybe due to an intervention when somebody moved uh, A. Unfortunately, this is the standard situation in current machine learning, current deep learning in particular, where every weight in the neural net is trying to change in order to uh, adapt to uh, a change in distribution. And so this causes very slow transfer to changes in distribution, um, very bad robustness, and, and what we call catastrophic forgetting. Uh, because every part of the neural net is trying to be involved in every part of the work that the neural net is doing. Now, this comes f with advantages um, in terms of um, uh, sharing of statistical strength, but, but it, it also comes with a, a, a difficulty in uh, how many examples are needed when we move from one distribution to another distribution. So we can, we can test that idea empirically. Uh, that very simple case that I told you about where you have just these two random variables A and B, um, we can, we can uh, consider two models. One which is the correct causal model. It says uh, A is a causal B and we decompose this P of A times P of B given A or the other model that goes in the other direction. And, um, and we can pre-train those models on, on the, the first distribution. Then we can see how fast they adapt as new examples of a modified distribution where P of A has, uh, P of a, a has changed, um, uh, how fast they adapt to that. And so what we see in the figure on the x-axis is the number of new examples from the modified distribution. And on the y-axis is the, is the log likelihood. So we would like that curve to rise as quickly as possible. It's called the learning curve, right? And we can see that eventually, as you train both models with enough data that it will converge to the same thing, which is gonna be a good model of the, of the new joint distribution. But what's interesting is that the model that corresponds to the correct causal direction learns faster. It adapts faster to the new um, distribution. And, and that's important because uh, if we had only looked at the training data from the first distribution, we wouldn't be able to say uh, whether um, A causes B or B causes A was the right model. Um, the other thing that we see from this figure, if we pay attention, is that, um, well, 
in fact, we could do some sort of model selection. If we look at how fast um, each of the two potential ca uh, causal hypotheses uh, is learning. So the, the, the correct one is learning faster. We could, so we, if we measure how fast one is learning with respect to the other, we could pick up that the blue curve with the correct model is the, is, is the right one. Right? And, and interestingly, it's at the beginning when we don't have a lot of data that there's the most signal about what is the right causal direction. So, you know, around like 10 examples or something, this is where there's the biggest spread between the, uh, the, 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 the likelihood that you observe with the uh, correct model versus the incorrect model. So, you know, traditionally in machine learning, when you don't have a lot of data, where you, you have too many parameters, uh, it, it, it's bad, and like people trying to cope with that. But what I'm saying here is that the situations where you don't have enough data um, because you're in a new environment or something are precisely the situations that give you the most signal to tell you how to modularize knowledge, how to break up the knowledge in the right pieces, how to discover the causal structure. So this is like really good news. Um, and, uh, and so we can turn the speed of adaptation and, and, the, and the difficulty faced in adapting to changes in, day, in distribution as an asset, as a feature, as a signal to figure out what is the right way of modularizing knowledge, how to factorize uh, distribution in this case. So, th so this connects with a, a talk that was given just a couple of weeks ago by Leon Boutou at uh, iClear, um, where he said, nature does not shuffle environments. We shouldn't. And what he means is that traditionally machine learning, we take the data and we just shuffle it so the order doesn't matter anymore, right? Uh, because then we, we, we satisfy the IID hypothesis, the test data is from the same distribution as the training data, and so on. But the real data usually comes uh, in a non-stationary way, like maybe you know, day one of data collection, day two of data collection, uh, and maybe some things have changed along the way. And usually we you know, consider that a hindrance. But with this new way of thinking, it's really the other way around. We should use those changes in distribution, those non-stationarities, as a source of information, which currently we're discarding. And what it tells us is how we should structure our model so that the models can adapt better and faster to those non-stationarities, something we haven't done previously in machine learning. Um, so we can use that signal to actually train machine learning systems. Um, but we're going we're gonna to do this in a meta-learning way. So meta-learning is a fairly popular approach recently in machine learning. Actually, dates back to much earlier. Um, I worked on this with my brother in the early 90s. And, um, but, but until recently, we didn't have the compute power to do meta-learning. So what is meta-learning? The idea of meta-learning is that um, we're going to consider an inner loop of learning and an outer loop of learning. Think in the early days, the way I was thinking about this is the outer loop is evolution, say, and the inner loop is learning of individual agent. And so the um, inner loop is like normal learning, but the outer loop is a special kind of learning that tries to modify some choices, like, like your genes, such that the inner loop is successful in some sense, like, for example, uh, generalizing better or uh, responding faster to changes in distribution, which is what, what we are focusing on here. So what we're going to do is define a meta-learning objective. In other words, for the part of the model which is going to be stable and captures uh, long-term knowledge about the world, um, we're going to define an objective function that's going to tell us how to modify those meta-parameters so that the regular parameters can do their job better, so that uh, we can uh, adapt faster to the new distribution. And the metaparameters we've chosen to consider here are two things. So one um, I've already mentioned, which is the, the structural hypothesis, the, the causal graph. Uh, in, you know, what are the arrows and where they are in the, in the graphical model that relates the variables with each other? And, and the second thing that um, we would like to consider as a metaparameter, actually, is what I call the encoder. Remember, I told you about the examples with you know, my eyes being shut, and, um, and the right space of representation isn't the pixels, but it's some, something high level where there's a bit that says my eyes are open or closed, right? Um, so uh, 
In general, we don't know what is that space, but we would like to find a mapping, an encoder, that transforms the raw data to these high-level spaces. This is, this is something that uh, deep learning researchers have been you know, working on for years now, um, and, and we have come up with all kinds of training objectives to try to do that, unsupervised, supervised, reinforcement learning, and so on. But here I'm bringing another kind of objective, which could be added to the other ones, um, which can help to find a transformation from the raw data to high-level variables, such that those high-level variables have causal relationships with each other, with each other, such that when there are changes in distribution, it's easy to recover uh, from those changes by looking at what happens at that high level rather than looking at the low level. Okay, so we did run experiments with that setup with uh, um, two hypotheses, which one way to think about it is that now we have four modules, like four neural net modules, each capturing either a marginal distribution or a conditional distribution. And we have two uh, structural hypotheses um, about how to factorize the joint. And, um, and so we're gonna define an objective that measures how well each of the two hypotheses is doing at the adaptation. So the, the things in the bottom is uh, what we call the online likelihood. It's, it's sort of a uh, regret. In other words, as the parameters theta t uh, change over time, um, and new examples are being seen, we are measuring how well we are predicting or uh, producing high probability for the observations. And, and the product of all these likelihoods along the, the learning path is this online likelihood uh, uh, denoted uh, uh, L uh, here. here. Um, and, and so we're gonna have an online likelihood for each of our two hypotheses, and then we're gonna have a mixture between those two hypotheses. So we're gonna have a, a mixture parameter here, gamma, that controls uh, how much we believe one hypothesis versus the other hypothesis. Uh, so sigma is the sigmoid, so it's the probability that we are giving to each of the two hypotheses. And now what we'd like to do is to tune this meta parameter gamma that's gonna control our belief of what is the right hypothesis. And as we see more and more episodes of uh, changes in distribution, we can change our belief so that the, the hypothesis that's correct is gonna dominate in our belief. And so we, we define this, um, this, the log of this uh, mixture over um, the online likelihoods as the meta objective. In other words, it's the it's how the encoder and how the, the, the structural parameters here, uh, gamma, are gonna be updated. Whereas the regular parameters, the thetas, which govern the conditional distributions and the marginal distributions will be updated in the usual way by stochastic gradient descent on the likelihood. All right, and, and we have some, some math to show that actually this will converge to the right answer. Uh, if, you, if you present many uh, episodes of changes in distribution, uh, and we've done a lot of experiments in, in the two variable case to, to validate that. Um, and we, we did experiments with discrete variables with uh, MLPs uh, uh, instead of tables, um, with simple uh, joint distributions based on Gaussian relationships, uh, with uh, non-Gaussian relationships and multimodal distributions. And in all cases, we're able to recover the, the correct causal model uh, you know, is it A or B that's the cause or the effect? We've also done experiments where we try to learn that encoder that I was telling you about. So for those experiments, um, we are still doing like toy experiments, right? Uh, this is not yet a robot doing it, but it will come. Um, um, we have a ground truth joint distribution, say the variables A and B that I've been talking about, but now instead of observing those variables directly, the learner observes a transformation, an unknown transformation of them. So for example, here they have been rotated, and so the learner sees X and Y. Um, so uh, what the learner has to do is to learn two things. It has to learn an encoder that maps X and Y to something hopefully uh, similar to A and B, so we call it U and, U and V and it has to learn the, the causal relationships between U and V. And uh, when we do that, uh, we're gonna jointly optimize the, 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 the model between U and V and the causal graph between U and V, as well as the parameters of the encoder. And, and that works too. It's, it's more complicated from an optimization point of view, but it, it, it works. Okay. Um, we also have ongoing work um, that hopefully we're gonna submit to NeurIPS on uh, extending this to larger graphs. I, I won't have time to go into the details of this, um, but one idea is that we're gonna have MLPs that uh, 
uh, capture each of the conditionals, and that the input of these MLPs, we're going to have um, binary masks, which control which of the other variables are going to be used as input. And those, those binary variables are going to be sampled from our belief distribution that controls um, which edge of the graph uh, we believe should be present or not. Um, I'm going to skip that. Uh, and so we've run experiments first with uh, uh, three variables, which is a very interesting case for causality because it includes things like dealing with confounders and colliders and, and so on, uh, and also larger graphs. Um, let me skip this. And, and maybe uh, for the little time that I have left, tell you about uh, slightly uh, bigger picture uh, uh, questions. So, um, uh, one way to think about this, which uh, connects well with what we know about the brain, is that uh, we have different time scales at which learning is happening. So, I, I'm going to go back to the analogy with evolution. So, evolution is like very slow time scale, and then we have the individual learning, which is, you know, much faster. But actually, there's much more than these two time scales, right? So, for example, an inner loop inside learning is inference. Right, so given some, uh, uh, an input, say your robot is going to do uh, sort of adaptation to what it's currently seeing and infer the right action. So, so there's not necessarily any learning there, but it, there's a sort of optimization going on, which is an inner loop. Um, and even within learning, you could have different time scales. In fact, in the brain, we know that different areas of the, of the brain uh, learn at different rates. And some, uh, some aspects of the world uh, can be uh, caught very quickly, changes can be adapted, can be captured very quickly, where others could take months and months because those areas of the brain are not, are meant to capture longer term aspects of it. So, so uh, in our current work, we are using this old idea from neuroscience that there are fast weights and slow weights, uh, with the slow weights, of course, changing more slowly and the fast weights being able to adapt faster and capturing different aspects of, of, the, of the world. Um, this is also interesting in connection to what we know about how babies learn. So infants um, are not able to move much in the world, but yet they're able to learn quite a lot by almost purely observational data. But, but it's interesting that what they're observing is not stationary. It's the result of interventions from their parents. Or if you're building robots, you know, the, the grad students who are playing with the robots are doing things in the environment, and the, the robot or the baby can take advantage of... Um, those changes in order to figure out, at least to some extent, the cause and effect relationships that exist in the world. And of course, later, when they start intervening in the world, um, they can be much more efficient at capturing that knowledge about the world. And this is also something we observe in our experiments. When the learner doesn't know what the intervention was, you can still uh, figure out cause and effect because there were changes in distribution. But if the learner has some clues about what the changes were, then uh, it can capture much faster that knowledge about the world. All right, so uh, to close, I want to mention uh, a few people who are working with me on, on these uh, projects related to causality at, at Mila. Uh, Tristan Deleu, Nazim Rahman, Rosemary Kay, Alexa Bilyanyuk, Anirudh Goyal, Sébastien Lachapelle, Chris Paul, Rémi Le Priol, and Simon Lacazurien. And we have a paper on archive uh, that you can already look at, which summarizes some of the work I talked about. Thank you. So I believe we now have time for some questions. Thank you again for a very exciting talk. Uh, we have some time for questions. He actually has to catch a flight, I think, in less than one hour. So we'll have uh, a very short time, probably no more than uh, five or six minutes for questions. So go ahead. Yes. Thanks, and thanks for the opportunity to ask the question. Thank you very much, Benji, for this very nice uh, overview and explanation, both of this fundamental problem with deep learning and the direction towards the solutions. Um, even in detail, like the steps towards the solution. Um, you know, establish the causal relationship between the variables, and even the mechanism to find out the variables, and to look at more complex relationships where two variables um, combine together. 
Um, so I wonder if you're also looking into if uh, this is always possible, whether you can say in advance, looking at your system, uh, that such decomposition into modular components uh, where you can have local intervention, if it's always possible, you know, which conditions uh, can one set on the system a priori to say we will be able to do that? We will know this meta-learning will converge. And then maybe also the path, you know, what shall we do to make the meta-learning converge? Well, so that's a good question. Uh, is it always possible? I don't think it's always possible. So think about, I think the best way to answer your question is to think about human knowledge. There are lots of things about the world which we know. And, and if you look at the kind of knowledge we have about the world, it is decomposed in pieces. That's why we're able to talk about it. Each sentence or each little description uh, or each wiki page, like, is it like little nugget of knowledge that is somewhat independent of other pieces of knowledge. So um, all the things that humans are good at uh, that they can communicate, I think uh, would be fair game for machines to also discover. Uh, and maybe there are other things that we haven't discovered yet that could, could have those properties that they, they, it's, um, it makes sense to describe them through the notion of these causal variables. But it, you know, there are things that don't fit well this picture um, and, and we shouldn't uh, discard them either, but that maybe uh, approach them with different, different uh, uh, methods. Any other questions? So uh, this is exciting, uh, but um, do you have any examples of robots using that uh, math behind it, that so causality actually? I must confess, I tried it also once. And we didn't get it to run, but uh, this is a few years ago, and I just wanted to know what, as to whether there's any progress. So the research at the intersection of machine learning and causality is very new. Uh, there's been, of course, research in causality uh, for decades in, in many areas, you know, sometimes quite far from computer science. Um, and uh, I think it, this, what I'm talking about here, is, is not like something you could use tomorrow in your robot. Uh, we are at the point where we're thinking about running very simple simulations of, of simple agents, um, and uh, this is already challenging. There, this, there, there are many things we don't understand about how to optimize these, these causal structures and so on. Um, but I think it's really important because robot, I mean, thinking in robotics application, because um, robots uh, have to face these non stationarities all the time. Uh, if you think about a robot that's wandering around, right? Just the fact that the environment isn't always the same because you're discarding new aspects of it. This is non-stationarity, um, and so you'd like you'd like robots to be able to quickly adapt to those changes, quickly adapt to uh, new concepts or new uh, agents coming in their environment, and so on. So we have uh, one last question there. Uh, hi, Professor Benjo. Great talk. Um, I think. I think there's a uh, very, really exciting advancement in this disentanglement, uh, disentanglement representation learning. There's better way, there's TC way. But if you look at this work, they all sort of put a kind of model prior structures, prior structure in the models, and then they don't generate, they don't scale beyond like simple toy data set. And I guess my question is really that uh, if you put that priors, say disentanglement whatsoever, this cause to, this likely to cause like inductive bias. And how do you? How do you say generalization in this case? And also, uh, say if we are going to use this thing someday, you know, beyond beyond this toy that I said, do you think like we actually eventually need label instead of just purely uh, unrepresentation learning or maybe semi representation semi semi supervised learning like as a like as a middle way? Thank you. All right. Thanks for your question. So. Inductive bias is actually at the heart of what machine learning is about, right? Uh, there's the no free lunch theorem that says that there is no completely generic machine learning. And what, um, one way to think about machine learning methods is that they correspond to some assumptions about the world, implicit or explicit, which can allow a learner to do a good job on a variety of tasks, in a particular set of tasks. And um, um, 
yeah, I think what we're doing is trying different inductive biases. Some are very specialized to a particular task, some are more generic. The kinds of things I'm talking about today are fairly generic because causality is a property of the world that which uh, works in, in you know, many circumstances. But there are lots and lots of other uh, inductive biases that uh, I think would make sense and, and still remain fairly general and would apply to almost any agent in, in like our real world. Um, in terms of... Um, uh, knowing what works and what doesn't work, I mean, it's, 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 it ends up being an empirical question. You, you have to try it in, in you know, your domain to see if, if it's going to work. Um, but it, it's important to keep in mind that the kind of generalization that uh, I'm talking about is slightly different from what has been the traditional view of generalization. The traditional view is we have one distribution and we want to generalize within that distribution. Here we're starting to ask the question of how do we generalize out of distribution. And meta-learning is really the subfield of machine learning which is driving that sort of questioning. Thank you again, everyone. I think with that, we'll stop. And again, a round of applause for our speaker.